Okay, <clears throat> great. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to talk with everybody this morning. Uh, the central question before us is whether Europe can take primary responsibility for its own security or whether it has to stay forever dependent primarily on American protection. And as Hugo has just summarized very nicely, uh, last year they published a, this lengthy article arguing the latter, saying Europe basically can't defend itself. Um, and they made three claims, which he's also summarized nicely. Uh, first, that European defense capabilities were so deficient it would take forever or at least a decade or more for them to be able to defend themselves. Um, second, uh, related to that, that Russia's military was actually a lot more capable than comparisons of defense expenditures suggested. So, you know, NATO Europe might spend three to four times what Russia spent every year, but Russia got a lot more bang for its rubles. Uh, and then finally, they argued that Europe's ability to balance Russia was fatally undermined by different strategic priorities, which they termed strategic cacophony. And they based this on a survey of European elites, which I think did show a considerable, though not complete, difference of views among different European countries. Now, as some of us pointed out back then, each of those claims was debatable. Uh, in our view, Steve and Hugo had understated Europe's military potential, overstated how long it would take to build it up, and exaggerated Russia's capabilities. And some of us also questioned whether a survey of European officials that was taken with the American defense umbrella firmly in place and no imminent danger on the horizon, whether that told you very much about how Europe, Europeans would think or act if the umbrella were removed or if a clear and present danger arose. Uh, for, unfortunately for world peace, we don't have to debate this counterfactual. Uh, Vladimir Putin ignored every human subject regulation in the books and has arranged a natural experiment for us. Um, and I think it's actually relatively rare that a scholarly article gets subjected to a real world test quite so quickly. Um, so first, the war reminded us that Europe's latent defense potential is far from trivial. It has advanced defense industries. It produces arms that are already helping Ukrainians such as the NLAW anti-tank missile, which is a joint Swedish-British production, the British Star Street ground-to-air missile. Um, and furthermore, if Europe has to build up capabilities, U.S. defense industries are quite eager to sell uh, weapons like the Lockheed Martin F-35s that Germany has already announced it's going to buy. Uh, second, Far from demonstrating fearsome military capabilities, I think the invasion of Ukraine has shown that Russia is much less capable uh, than Steve and Hugo claimed. Remember, this is a war that Russia had months, if not years, to plan, and it's been a debacle on multiple levels. Uh, it's not just that they were overly optimistic. I think there's lots of evidence now that the combination of corruption and skimming and inept leadership, not to mention poor performance by conscript troops, leaves Russia with much less capability than its rubles ought to have bought. Uh, this is the kind of thing that Caitlin Talmadge describes well in her book, The Dictator's Army. It's what you often get from an army where loyalty is prized more than competence and where corruption is endemic throughout the entire society. So I think the claim that Europe's capabilities are a lot better than its defense expenditures suggested or that it poses a threat that Europe can't handle with a bit more effort isn't uh, nearly as persuasive anymore. And then finally, um, the idea of European strategic cacophony, I think, turned out to be something of an illusion. Now, there's no question there were disagreements about security a year or so ago when different nations of Europe all faced somewhat different problems and tended to emphasize the ones that were most salient to their particular situation. But once Europe was faced with an unmistakable act of aggression that exceeded everyone's expectations, they reacted pretty much as balance of power theory, or if you'll indulge me, balance of threat theory would lead you to expect. They announced increases in defense spending. They're funneling military aid to Ukraine despite the risks of escalation. They've agreed to far reaching economic sanctions, even though this has serious costs for them. Countries like Poland and Hungary have stopped feuding with Brussels. Viktor Orban has broken off his bromance with Putin. In short, these earlier differences about priorities vanished or at least declined enormously as soon as Europeans realized, 
all-out war in their neighborhood was still a possibility and that hard power still mattered. And even pacifist Germany seems to have gotten the memo. Now, your, your American diplomacy, what you might call alliance leadership, played some role in this process, but I think it's striking how rapidly Europe responded and how little effort it took the Biden administration to get people on board. This is very different than the situation, say, when we invaded Iraq in 2003. Germany had resisted American pressure to stop the Nord Stream pipeline for years. Russia ended that policy in a couple of weeks. Um, it's also worth noting that Europeans have growing doubts about the U.S. commitment. You know, what if Trump comes back? And the Biden administration's made it clear that there are limits to how far it's willing to go here. So all in all, it seems clear to me that Europe is increasingly willing to translate its enormous power potential into a defense capability that leaves it less dependent on the U.S. going forward. So the bottom line for me is that Europe can, in fact, take care of its security problems if given reason to do so and some time to get ready. Uh, those of us in the restraint camp are not saying that the United States should leave NATO overnight. This has to be a gradual transition process. But because China is a far greater geopolitical challenge to the United States than Russia is, it's time to move towards a new division of labor where Europe takes primary responsibility for its own defense. And the United States serves not as first responder, but as essentially the defender of last resort. I think Vladimir Putin has shown us that this is both desirable and feasible. So I give Hugo and Steve credit for writing a provocative article that staked out a clear position, provoked a very useful debate. Uh, most of us have written articles that didn't stand the test of time, and I could give you a list of mine. So that's nothing to be embarrassed about. I think writing something that turns out to be wrong helps us uh, as a field advance, and it's certainly preferable to writing something trivial or refusing to take a clear position. Uh, Hugo and Steve have both written serious works of lasting importance, uh, but I think this article is not one I would double down on defending too strongly. Let me stop there, and I will look forward to the rest of the conversation.